Good afternoon to all who are new here. Welcome. Due to COVID-19, we have moved our regularly scheduled in-person journal clubs to an online platform. Fortunately, our fearless head of the journal club and liaison with the BOC, Brittany, has been working diligently to ensure that we are able to provide these educational opportunities successfully. We have over 280 athletic trainers registered for today's webinar. For additional webinar education opportunities, you can visit our website and register directly for the webinar or sign up for the email list to be notified of upcoming webinars. For all athletic trainers who are intending to get live CPUs from the BOC, immediately after the webinar, complete the quiz, which will become available once the webinar has finished. In order to access the quiz, you must remain in the webinar until it closes. One hour after the webinar concludes, you will be emailed a link to the evaluation and assessment. You will have 24 hours to complete the assessment. Once you've completed the quiz and the assessment, you will receive your statement of credit via email within the next two weeks. We are in process of changing this process, so please keep an eye out on your emails in terms of your statements of credit. This is a free webinar, so I appreciate your patience as this process is currently taking up to two weeks. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit the question and we'll review the questions at the conclusion of the presentation. I am pleased today to introduce our speakers. Alyssa Dusner is a physical therapist who got her bachelor's degree at Indiana University and went through her physical therapy school at the University of Florida and is certified in BFR. And Lauren Goforth is, uh, got her bachelor's degree at the University of Florida and then did her physical therapy program at Nova Southeastern University. These are two physical therapists who work at Optimal Performance Physical Therapy in Pinellas County, Hillsborough County, and Polk County in Florida. So I'm gonna let these ladies take it away and I'm gonna transition the slides over to their computer. Thank you very much, Dr. Henney. All righty, so, um, uh, basically, today we are going to be presenting on blood flow restriction therapy, um, and there are two of us presenting today. Uh, I have just begun to start to have a significant need for uh, having these types of therapies in the clinic, and so because of that, it led me to um, doing a whole bunch of research um, within this area. And so luckily within our company, Optimal Performance and Physical Therapies, we actually have a leader um, with us who has um, significant experience with blood flow restriction therapies and has helped with some of the education of the therapists throughout our company um, to be able to bring these type of modalities to uh, multiple clinics. Um, so that being said, um, I am going to start by going into a little bit of um, some of the background and then Alyssa will pick up from there. So today, like I said, we are covering blood flow restriction therapy. Hold on, Hold on one second. Let's see if I can. I'm in presentation mode and I should hopefully be able to. Put, there we go. Okay. Um, so I have no conflicts of interest of any kind for this presentation. So what is blood flow restriction therapies? Um, and so blood flow restriction therapies is basically a training modality uh, which partially restricts arterial flow and fully restricts venous outflow um, in musculature during exercise. So the technique involves applying an external pressure or a tourniquet to the most proximal region of the limb resulting in hypoxia. Um, with this type of therapy, it is very important that you are assessing a specific percentage of limb arterial flow occlusion in order to prescribe the therapies. And so this is called limb occlusion pressure. Uh, the patient performs specific pres prescribed exercise protocols resulting in a meta metabolic cascade to positively change muscle, bone, tendon, um, result in a neuromuscular response, as well as have positive implications in capillary beds. So 
So some of the history behind BFR is that um, the concept originated in the 1970s by Dr. Yoshiaki Soto with the inception of Katsu resistance training. However, the modes of vascular occlusion in the beginning included both ropes or bands, um, ka meaning additional and atsu meaning pressure. Um, so then in 1984, the first generation electronic <clears throat> tourniquet systems were invented. And it was not until the development of third generation tourniquet systems in the early 2000s before BFR, BFR became um, able to be performed precisely um, and safely in the clinic. So this led to clinical impl uh, implementation and investigation of the use of BFR in select patients who could not exercise with heavy resistance due to various restrictions. And then in more recent years, BFR has been adopted as an adjunct to traditional therapies for musculoskeletal injuries and was popular, popularized by Johnny Owens, who's a physical therapist. Uh, BFR was initially implemented in his clinic for building muscles, muscular strength and hypertrophy in the military limb salvage patients. And then just within a few years, the potential for BFR in other subspecialties was recognized and there was a transition from trauma patients to treating both sports and orthopedic populations as well. So the main positives, uh, well, there's multiple benefits to BFR, um, but uh, some of the most predominant ones are an adaptive response of muscular strength and hypertrophy are able to be reached at lower training loads, making it a novel clinical modality. And so as we know, muscle weakness and atrophy cause delay in return to functional activities. And traditional loading for resistance training places significant stress on connective tissues, joints, um, and surrounding tissues as well that can be detrimental to tissue healing. Adaptations that typically require use of high loads, such as above your 70% of your one rep max, are able to be achieved at lower loads, such as between 20 to 40% of that one rep max. So the goal is a more rapid return for muscle wasting, weakness, and pain to tolerance of progressive loading. And the goal is basically get back function as quickly as possible. So in the end, it bridges the gap. So there are multiple types of application um, and that many of you have probably come into, um, into knowledge with. Um, and so basically there are um, a lot of different options out there. And so which ones are ones that should be used clinically, um, which are ones that uh, are not acceptable use, um, especially because there could be a varying amount of information there. So when you look at a review of BFR rehabilitation literature, it shows that there is a significant amount of inconsistencies that exist in methodology and equipment and levels of restriction pressure used. So current non-personalized non methodologies, such as um, setting BFR pressures may include, um, so current non-personalized methodologies of setting BFR pressures may include rather than restrict flow. Um, and increasing the risk of injury during rehabilitation. So these non-personalized methods of setting pressure do not provide a consistent stimulus within or across patients, reducing the efficacy of BFR rehabilitation and inhibiting the meaningful comparison of a full range of BFR studies. So a restriction pressure level set for each individual patient based on a percentage of limb occlusion pressure measured at rest and applied using a surgical grade tourniquet cut enables those individual patients to receive a safe and consistent BFR stimulus compared to other methods of setting the restriction pressure. Um, so such as these non-acceptable methods are going to include wraps or belts, um, unfortunately, these, these, of course, are going to be the ones that are financially um, the cheapest to be able to get into the clinic. Um, the acceptable next level ones are going to be ones that, again, are using a handheld Doppler that can adequately, adequately assess um, and prescribe that limb occlusion pressure. Um, those main ones are going to be rock cuff, H plus cuff, and sports rehabilitation tourniquets, along with some of those other ones. And then, of course, there is the gold standard. 
Um, and then the downside of some of the gold standard, um, such as the Delphi, is that it has significant costs that comes along with it that makes it difficult to have in small clinics. So with BFR, uh, what is it indicated for? So evidence supports the use of BFR for load compromise, ligamentous repairs or reconstructions, sarcopenia, muscle imbalances, partial and total joint arthropathies, tendinopathies, and arthritis. And so by using a tourniquet at safe and low loads, we can manipulate the healing environment around injured tendon, muscle, and bone through increasing collagen synthesis. Low loads allow for protection and reduction in stress of injured soft tissues, um, joints, and bone. These beneficial effects do not seem to be limited to specific populations, as they have been observed in a variety of individuals, such as in injured patients, elderly, healthy, untrained, and athletes. You can see how it ben its benefits for creating muscle hypertrophy, um, increasing type 2 muscle fibers um, and increasing strength have positive implications for populations involving muscle wasting, sarcopenia, and cachexia. The acute hypoxic state leads to increased blood vessel formation, which also has positive implications for bone health. And so evidence also has uh, supported the systemic response of BFR on proximal strength as well um, that Alyssa might have time to touch on later. All right, I'll let Alyssa take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here and for tolerating my portion of the presentation, which is all about the science. Um, when we're discussing the science of blood flow restriction therapy, we have to keep in mind that we don't really have a strong grasp on the direct mechanism of action or mechanisms of action, but we have a grasp on the effects secondary to application of uh, blood flow restriction uh, therapies at a prescribed load frequency and duration for the lower extremities and the upper extremities. So we're trying to create a metabolic environment for change. We're altering the neuromuscular activity through afferent feedback. So adding muscle cell, or excuse me, yes, muscle cells require substantial metabolic change as well as increased energy to keep up with the demands. So anabolic processes require substantial metabolic changes and in a substantial increase in energy into the system. BFR induces hypoxia in tissues distal to the tourniquet and prevents venous return, which pulls blood and metabolic byproducts distal to the occlusive point. Again, the point of BFR is to mimic heavy load training, which itself induces a hypoxic environment. Use of BFR mimics heavy lifting and aerobic environment in tissues distal to tourniquet while completing low load exercises of 20% one rep max. Anaerobic workload pushes from slow twitch to fast twitch muscle fiber recru recruitment. So let's talk uh, what's happening distal to the tourniquet. You'll hear distal to the tourniquet over and over and over and over and over again. So um, the first thing that we're going to talk about is uh, mechanical tension uh, to create an environment primed for strengthening hypertrophy and increase in motor units. So according to the American College of Sports Medicine, we need eight to 10 total sets for a specific muscle or muscle group in the upper or lower extremities per week at, it says 65% one rep max, but really it's 70 to 80% one rep max with most of the research completed over two to three days per week. So eight to 10 total sets of activities at 70% one rep max, two to th three days per week to produce this muscle strength hypertrophy and motor unit gains. That's a lot of load, thinking of that with our elderly patients or our patient post-surgery. So can we, can we, can the injured, rehabbing, elderly, sedentary individuals perform this level of exercise? 70% or greater of one rep max um, is essentially doing the HIIT training or heavy lifting. Can they do that? Can you do that two to three days per week without feeling awful or not being able to recover? 
So the application of BFR can mimic this 70 to 80% one rep max at the 20 to 30% load level. So think of the strain to the muscle tissue and how this can kickstart your system without having that negative, oh my God, I'm in so much pain for 72, 96 hours. Think of that process. Moving on to what happens distal to the tourniquet uh, metabolite accumulation. We're gonna be here in this portion for a while. Um, some of it will turn into alphabet soup and I do apologize, but do stick with me <laughs> as much as you can. So metabolite theory of how BFR works scientifically, lactate, feeling the burn. So increase in lactate production by taking muscle to fatigue, you're obviously gonna be feeling that burn, will also increase the motor unit recruitment. All of this increase in lactate accumulation is going to stimulate or be accompanied by the, the increase in growth hormone. And as we know, growth hormone enhance, uh, enhances the rate of healing and maintenance of muscle, tendon, and bone. Growth hormone increases collagen synthesis, um, and injury and surgery disrupts this, disrupts this process and is actually antithetical to collagen synthesis. Um, use of BFR can stimulate the above while reducing potential stress to injured soft tissue. Again, we're thinking of limiting those minimal, moderate, severe rhabdomyolysis situations of heavy load of 70 to 80% one rep max. So moving right along from growth hormone to IGF factor one, um, we have the pooling of metabolites, which stimulates the increase in IGF-1 proteins. So this venous occlusion um, helps this cascade initiate. We have the pooling of metabolites because we have venous occlusion, which is increased growth hormone, which signals an in increase in IGF-1, which signals the fusion of satellite cells and the creation of more myocytes. And, and do remember satellite cells are the stem cells of muscle cells. So with BFR, we stimulate that lactate accumulation. We stimulate that lactate accumulation to get an increase in growth hormone. The growth hormone signals an increase in IGF-1. The IGF-1 says to satellite cells, we need more muscle cells because we have a lot of load and we need to make more muscles. So to continue with the metabolite accumulation theory, uh, let's talk about myostatin. Myostatin regulates anabolic and catabolic muscle processes, plays a large role in increasing fibrosis and fibrotic morphology within the muscle and tendon following injury and surgery. Following an injury or surgery, the system ramps up myostatin in muscle tissue. This results in muscle fibrosis in a fibrotic environment, which itself is another cascade of continuous fibrosis. So keep in mind, in order to build muscle, you have to have the net proteins be positive towards the anabolism. So myostatin being ramped up after surgeries or after an injury is, again, not going to help. It'd be more catabolic. So BFR tricks the system into thinking it has completed a heavy lift and or HIIT training. Again, that volume of 70% one rep max to the lower extremity or upper extremity. Mimicking and performing anaerobic activity down regulates the systemic and local myostatin. Down regulation correlates with increased muscle strength, hypertrophy, and increased motor units. There are some new research out there produced by um, a few of our leaders in BFR or occlusion therapy that have prescribed a statin drug as well as BFR during the rehab process to promote this rapid improvement. Again, we're trying to kickstart the system to rapidly improve or move through stage one into stage two into return to function. So the, this use of BFR can also be for prevention and rehabilitation. Metabolite theory, alphabet soup time, M tor C1, mammalian target of rapamycin complex one, because is right. 
So this is the uh, switch to turn the cell growth on or turn the cell growth off. So we already have talked about that cascade, lactic accumulation, growth hormone, all that good stuff. Now this, now this mTOR C1 is activated from growth factor, energy status of the cell, and heavy load exercise. All of these things are mimicked with BFR. So taking a muscle to failure induced through BFR exercise or heavy lifting HIIT training activates the mTOR C1 process. So it translates to increased muscle protein synthesis. Again, we're tilting that, that balance of net protein positive or negative. Are we building or are we breaking down? Heavy lifting at 70% one rep max for 10 sets within two to three days of training per week per upper or lower extremity um, helps to promote the mTOR C1 being turned on. BFR is 20 to 30% one rep max with the same frequency and volume as above stimulates mTOR C1 pathway. So a lower load, 20 to 30% one rep max, can produce the same pathway without having as much strain. Keeping all of this in mind, you're hearing a lot about energy, you're hearing a lot about growth, you're hearing a lot about, excuse me, improving pathways or speeding up pathways. We have to keep in mind nutrition. It is important to continuously speak with our patients, our clients, um, our individuals who are training about nutrition, especially when we are performing blood flow restriction therapy or any heavy load training. Without appropriate food and hydration, all this activity and strategizing and education and evidence-based exercise prescription, it is all wasted, literally it is for not. Specific to BFR, nutrition intake increase of amino acids is very important, especially leucine. This helps us build our muscle proteins. These can be found in egg, whey powder, beef, chicken, soybean, soybean powder, almonds, pecans, or pecans, peanuts, and salmon. Um, dairy, uh, particularly whey protein dairy, is better in liquid form. The hamburger is better than steak because it takes less for the body to break down the hamburger. And these are just general numbers. So um, I'm sure our athletic trainers know that in terms of giving a good idea for an individual um, intake of protein, we usually tell them 1.5 kilograms per pound body weight of protein they need to ingest if they're doing heavy load training. Same thing goes for BFR. So these numbers here are kind of general. A young healthy male will need 20 grams of protein. That's just to maintain homeostatic whatever for this young healthy male. Older males will need 40 grams of protein to stimulate protein synthesis. So double what a young healthy male needs at homeostasis to promote protein synthesis. So just think about not even the population over 80, population over 50. Most of our females in rehab or in any stage of life, it's really hard to get them to understand how important hydration and nutrition is. So 40 grams of protein for an elderly male to be able to stimulate protein. And women will need a little bit more than those levels. So it's very important to keep nutrition and hydration in mind when we're having these discussions about rehab, about blood flow restriction therapy, about heavy load training, HIIT training. It is all for naught unless we feed the system, unless we provide energy for the system to utilize to build, it will literally go nowhere. So, more fun vegetable soup, <laughs> the metabolite accumulation metabolic theory, VEGF. Increases in vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, result in increased blood vessel formation and damaged bone and tissue. So stimulation of VEGF release occurs in hypoxic and lactic states, which the BFR promotes with venous occlusion. So moving a limb, from a state of high oxygenation to a state of low oxygenation stimulates bone marrow to cre create increased capillary beds. So it also, this, the stimulation of mesenchymal stem cells from bone marrow to bone, tendon, and muscle. So anecdotally, are we now talking prevention and rehab to restoration of things that we didn't have before? Remember, according to Wolf's Law, bone forms and reforms and heals via the load placed upon it. 
So through VEGF and the metabolic pooling environment, BFR creates distal to the tourniquet, BFR mimics high load through muscle, tendon, bone with load, low load training. Also of note here, the ability for BFR to mimic these high loads also usually increases the pination level or angle of a muscle into a tendon, which improves its, its power. So all of these things built up together help to uh, reduce the effects of having an injury or having a surgery on the disuse atrophy or the atrophy following surgery or the um, thinning of a tendon. BFR is important for bone health. It also can help prevent bone loss and improve bone formation because we're putting that, that tension, muscle tendon tension on the bone. So again, uh, Lauren spoke earlier about the sarcopenic um, population. This group of individuals, as long as there are no contraindications, will really benefit from having a kickstart from blood flow restriction therapy. We have finally made it out of the metabolite accumulation until, and to our last point here about what happens distal to the tourniquet, which is cell swelling. It's not just congestion, as it says in the first point. BFR is not just venous congestion. Other, otherwise, fluid would quickly leave the cells and tissues once the tourniquet is removed. Following BFR application, even in static mode without exercises, it's just on. Research indicates plasma fluid shifts into muscle cells. So it's not just getting a bigger limb and then going away. It's actually swelling the muscle cells. A dehydrated myocyte does not undergo protein synthesis. So we are hydrating the cell with BFR. BFR application to immobilize individuals can prevent muscle atrophy. This is something we will talk about a little bit more in exercise prescription. And speaking of indications and contraindications, I think Lauren's going to go over our safety. So um, I think that the, probably this is uh, one of the biggest questions um, that I've gotten about um, for use of this clinically is just the safety behind it. Um, so when used in a controlled environment by trained and experienced personnel, BFR training provides a safe training alternative for most individuals regardless of age or training status. So some things that we need to keep in mind for assessing the risk. Um, one of the biggest ones are obviously if you're tourniqueting a limb is the circulatory function. So you need to be keyed into any type of integumentary changes. Um, is the skin shiny? Uh, are nails brittle? Is there no hair? Uh, what does the color look like? Is there varicosities, capillary filling time, things along those lines. Um, obesity is another um, incident in which you would want to assess for also limb tissue that is loose um, which could potentially lead to breakdown um, when using a tourniquet system. Uh, arterial calcification, abnormal clotting times, uh, diabetes, tumor, general infection, hypertension, any cardiopulmonary conditions, renal compromise, clinically significant acid-based imbalance, arthrosclerotic vessels, antihypertensive medications, and creatinine supplements, all of which uh, these all must meet, have attained a physician clearance in order to uh, be able to perform BFR training. Also, what I had come across is that potentially Wells clinical prediction rule to assess DVT probability in, in at-risk subjects can be utilized prior to the application of BFR to assist clinicians and researchers in appropriate candidates. So contraindications for BFR therapies are going to be venous thromboembolism, impaired circulatory or peripheral vascular compromise, any previous revascularization of the extremity, extremities with dialysis access, cardiovascular disease, acidosis, sickle cell anemia, uh, extremity infection of any kind, a tumor distal to the tourniquet, medications and supplements known to increase clotting risk, any type of open fracture or wound, um, increased intracranial pressure, open soft tissue injuries again, post-traumatic lengthy hand reconstructions, severe crush injuries, severe uncontrolled hypertension, 
elbow surgery where there is concomitant excess swelling, um, skin grafts in which all bleeding points must be readily distinguished, a secondary delayed process um, after, or pro delayed procedures after immobilization, any type of vascular grafting of any kind, lumpectomies, and of course, cancer. All right, I will let Alyssa pick up exercise. So we've spoken about contraindications and indications. We've spoken about the um, science behind why it works or what we think helps to make BFR effective. How do we apply this? What do we need to do? So let's talk exercise prescription. Emphasis on the use prescription because we're not just willy nilly giving a patient here, do a knee extension exercise, three sets of 10, here's 10 pound ankle weights, go for it. No, it needs to be prescribed. That includes the limb occlusion pressure, that includes the sets and reps, that includes the weight. We need to be very aware of what we're putting our patients through. Training frequency. Low load BFR training can in theory be done daily due to the limited muscle damage created versus what heavy lifting does. And DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness is very short lived. Largest effect is seen within two to three days per week. So that's perfect for the clinical setting. We can do two to three days per week. Every day per week, I don't think any insurance pay for it. Um, <laughs> endurance training may not follow the same rules as strength training frequency it may need to be four to six applications per week for endurance benefits. So yes, VO2 max and endurance can improve with BFR. This application of uh, four to six times a week, again, this not necessarily in the clinical outpatient scenario, this might be in more of a return to sport or in a cash-based system. The training duration, uh, generally speaking, is 10 weeks of, of training to have the greatest effects. That's 10 weeks of BFR training. That doesn't mean we're done with physical therapy or training or rehab or return to practice, return to sport. Training intensity for BFR, as we've said, probably ad nauseum now, 15 to 30% of one rep max for strength. It's hard to assess the one rep max in a clinical setting. Uh, in outpatient, especially if we are about to prescribe, say, four to five different exercises for the lower extremity, this would take literally eight hours to do, <laughs> to get to get everyone's singular one rep max for the squat or one rep max for the um, knee extension or hamstring curl. It would take forever, a freaking day. So the utilization of something called the OmniRes, which is um, correlated to the um, Borg RPE scale, is very beneficial. So as you see there, it has a scale of zero to 10. Zero is extremely easy and 10 is extremely hard. So I'm giving a patient a leg extension. I put a 10 pound weight on them. I have them do a set of 10. I ask them, please tell me on this scale, zero to 10, where do you think it falls? And the patient tells me, well, I think that is a five on this scale. I know for my BFR prescription, that's too much. I need to bring it back. So if you want to think about it, if someone says, I just did my, my leg extension, my knee extension activity, and oh my goodness, it was a nine out of 10, that's very close to being at your one rep max. So the 10 would be your one rep max, okay? So between the two and the three there, where it says easy to somewhat easy is where you will find your happy spot for prescribing the um, right amount of weight. All right, exercise prescription for BFR protocols. How do we assess the limb occlusion pressure uh, for a personalized tourniquet, um, with a personalized tourniquet? It depends on what you have. So if you're lucky enough to be able to afford the Katsu or the Delphi, there's a third microchip processor out there that I can't remember the name of right now, but generally speaking, those three are at the top of the they're the gold standards, as we said before. So those three will be able to assess those limb occlusion pressures and be able to give you your percentage um, without much physical to do. If you're using something like the Grok cuffs or the H plus cuffs, 
you have to utilize this plus a handheld Doppler. So that's what we're mainly describing here. So a patient is lying supine, you'll do the same thing for the Delphi or the Katsu. You apply the tourniquet to the most proximal aspect of the upper or lower extremity. You place the handheld Doppler, uh, the probe, at the most distal pulse, okay? And sometimes it will be hard to find and sometimes people's anatomy is a little weird. So give yourself a little bit of an allotment of time here. You inflate the cuff until you hear the pulse no longer. So make sure you're in a place where you can hear the ch -ch 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 -ch. otherwise it's pointless. So you place the cuff, you, you inflate the cuff until you can't hear it anymore. You release the cuff slowly a little bit until you hear the start of the pulse again. I repeat this so that I have a good idea. I have the right number. Okay, so once I have found uh, say, for instance, someone's left leg has a limb occlusion pressure of 200 millimeters of mercury. I'm doing lower extremity tasks, as you see on the right side. The standardized limb occlusion pressure for BFR activities is 60 to 80 percent. Generally speaking, I try to keep it at that 80 percent of the total limb occlusion pressure to have the greatest effect. Now, 80% of 200, all right, that's 160 millimeters of mercury squeezing on your upper thigh for about eight minutes at a time. Most people can handle this. If we move down and look towards the limb occlusion pressure for upper extremity, we have 40 to 50%. So say in someone's left upper arm, it was about 150 millimeters of mercury to completely occlude. Generally speaking, I will start the upper extremity around 40% for the limb occlusion pressure just based on the fact that I haven't found someone who really tolerates that 50% straight away. Whereas for the lower extremity, I have found that they have been able to tolerate that 80% fairly well. It's just you're more sensitive in the upper extremity. And I think maybe people might have a little PTSD with blood pressure cuffs all around. <laughs> so, oh no, I think I went one too far, I'm sorry. So exercise pres prescription BFR protocol for strength and hypertrophy. So this is what we're mostly doing in the clinic, out in the field and with our patients. Target volume and load. Biggest thing you take from this, if it's not the 20% of one rep max, um, it is that you do four sets. You do the first set of 30, which is to get you to complete fatigue. Then you do three sets of 15 following that with 30 seconds of rest between. As you know, with, with your clients, with your patients, people cheat, they use momentum. It's important to instruct them on a two second concentric and eccentric phase so that they're not just throwing their limb through whatever they're doing and really not promoting the motor recruitment. So if you're doing four sets, one of 33 of 15, 30 seconds between each of them, this will take between six and eight minutes per activity to complete. You wanna load them at the 20 to 30% of one rep max, again, using that Omni Res or RPE to assess the load in a clinical setting. Uh, first set of 30, as I said before, is to tab out the Krebs cycle for lactate to build up. We want them to feel the burn. It's going to be hard for them to complete the initial 30. You, you cheer them on, you talk them through it, you clap for them when they're done and they get that 30 seconds of rest. But we really want them to push through and get that 30 done without taking a little breather break, the two second concentric, two second eccentric phases. You do not deflate the tourniquet during the 30 second rest periods between 30, 15, 15, and 15. Following the completion of the target volume of 75, um, deflate the tourniquet and rest for two minutes prior to beginning the next activity. So again, you have about six to eight minutes of activity, say knee extension activities for six to eight minutes. You time them, give them a two minute rest, and then you start up your hamstring curls or your quad sets or your glute sets, whatever you're doing for your next activity. Adjust the load and rest period uh, between each sets. Um, excuse me, adjust load and rest between sets prior to adjusting the limb occlusion pressure. So that's a key. If you want to highlight that or circle that, whatever. You do not, particularly for the lower extremity, you want to keep that, that limb occlusion pressure that you prescribed at about 80% as much as possible. You want to change every other variable 
the rest between first and the load second before you change the pressure. It is it is that tourniquet, it is that hypoxic, hypoxic environment with the occluded uh, venous return that is so important. We gotta keep that. So that's 75 total reps that they, that they have to finish. So if the patient achieves the 75 reps, we're gonna continue as we have trained before, as we prescribe before, and reassess that one rep max after one to three sessions. Um, anecdotally from my own practice, if this isn't the first time they've done it, let's say the second or third time they've done BFR and they've done the same BFR and they, they're able to achieve that, those 75 reps, if the next session they do the 75 reps at the same weight, we're bumping them up the next time. So do not stay at the same load level past one to three sec sessions. Again, remember that one rep max is hopefully is not a is not a fixed number. That sucker is going to be moving forward. It's going to be moving to the right on the scale. We're going to be increasing strength. But say they aren't they aren't able to to finish the 75 reps. Say they tap out, they burn out 60 to 74. We want you to continue with the training as prescribed, but extend the rest periods between sets three and four to 45 seconds until the patient is able to complete the 75 reps as, as described above. There might be someone who can only do 45 to 59 total reps. Continue with the training, but extend rest periods between all sets to 45 to 60 seconds until the 75 reps are completed. And then at that point, you attenuate the rest period back down to 30 seconds. If someone taps out, uh, with less than 44, there are, there are a lot of things going on. Um, you need to reduce the load by approximately 10% until the 75 reps can be achieved. So they can burn through that 30, but they can't get through that 15. We need to change the load. Exercise prescription BFR protocol for endurance improved VO2 max. Um, again, this is going to be kind of sort of limited in the outpatient scenario unless we're able to see a patient probably greater than 12 weeks past whatever has gone on with him. But this is good to know that um, if you have someone who is training to return to marathons or half marathons, or returning to SEAL training, whatever the heck they're doing, and they need to improve their endurance, um, we can still use BFR. So target volume and load for these kind of in, for these endurance improved VO2 max individuals. We want to get to, we want to utilize 40% VO2 max. So keep in mind, again, we don't have those lovely machines to assess VO2 max in most of our clinical settings unless we're in a large group or with a professional um, team. So RPE is strongly correlated with VO2 max and the heart rate reserve. So you want to be at 40% of, so if you use the Omni Res, you want to be at the 4 out of 10. If you're using the Borg RPE, you want to be between like a 7 and 10 on that scale. So begin at 5 minutes utilizing the BFR on the whole time and build to 15 minutes with the tourniquet inflated. For the lower extremities, you want that tourniquet around your thigh as far as you can get. You can do both thighs. You can do one thigh, and you want it at 80% occlusion. You can either have them walking or cycling. You can also add in there, you can have somebody doing running if they're completely masochistic or you're sadistic, either way. Uh, the best results are completing three times a week of eight weeks, but if you can only do two times a week, you can do 10 weeks, and you will produce the same kind of improvements. How BFR enhances VO2 max and overall endurance. This is kind of a review of the stuff that we have talked about before, but BFR induces a, an epoxic state with, uh, which creates a lactic acid cascade, growth hormone, IGF-1, mTOR C1, all that stuff, described earlier, which stimulates the satellite cells into muscle cells. So the number of cells increases. It also increases the number of mitochondria, which are able to deal with oxygen in our cells, which in turn, improves endurance in VO2 max. Hypoxic state also stimulates increased capillary beds, which increases the system's ability to tolerate tasks. When I did this course, 
a similar course and last September um, at my office in St. Petersburg, um, someone decided to try out the running with the cuffs on both legs. The gentleman was able to complete this task. He's like, this wasn't really a problem. He texted me the next day that he was very, very tired. So um, keep in mind, um, start slow. <laughs> okay, start very slow. <laughs> okay, exercise prescription BFR protocol for post conditioning. Um, you'll see there it says ischemic post conditioning. This can also be ischemic pre conditioning. It depends on what research you're looking at or what um, thought process you have. Keep in mind the scope of this. You'll see it over here. It's used following games. Uh, multiple practice sessions, heavy CrossFit hit activity, somebody who ran two marathons in a weekend, um, professional athletes who have to perform three games in one week. You see, if you can see where I'm going with this, this is generally speaking, not something the, the run of the mill outpatient facility is going to be doing unless it's something like cash based where you just have somebody come in, they're there for 50 minutes to an hour, laying down, doing nothing, but having the tourniquet squeeze them. So again, this isn't exactly something that's for the everyday setting. It, it could be a method to, to have a cash-based service or whatnot, but I think it's important for you guys to know it as well. So ischemic post-conditioning, pre-conditioning, it's the same protocol. You have 80% limb occlusion pressure for the lower extremity or the 50% for upper extremity. I will say most research is moving towards total limb occlusion, whatever you're doing on the upper or the lower extremity. So they've done a lot of research on the 80% and the 50%. As it says there, that's totally fine. But if you totally occlude the limb, it, it's similar or better in some of the research. So you have the tourniquet on either the legs or the upper extremity. Some people have it on both upper extremities and both lower extremities. You have it on for five minutes continuously. You do nothing. It turns off for five minutes and you rest. You do this for five total rounds. There are some places or some protocols that have you say, if you're doing this recovery or uh, preconditioning task, they will have the upper extremity, somebody will be squeezing a stress ball. Or if they're doing the lower extremities, they're just doing ankle pumps during those five minutes. This can be completed quite frequently, as often as two to three times a day. So again, and not really set up for everyday clinical setting. So this is great because it blocks um, potential muscle damage following strenuous uh, a strenuous event or strenuous activity where protein breakdown, so muscle breakdown is high. It actually helps to push the scale towards protein synthesis rather than breakdown. Again, avoiding that lovely rhabdomyolysis. Um, so this is for the post conditioning um, after games, multiple practices, et cetera, et cetera. So we're mitigating strength losses following heavy activities. Can be completed in a window of up to 72 hours following this activity. So how do you set the table with someone that is ready and willing, the doctor is cleared for BFR? What are they going to expect? So definitely let them know what they're going to feel. As the lactate builds up in the sets two to four, the lactate really builds up in the first set of 30. So that should say set number one. The difficulty to complete each concentric and eccentric phase increases perceived as burning perceived as, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> uh, but it's important to keep encouraging, pushing isn't the right word, but encouraging the people for people to continue with their reps. Patient will automatically feel their heart rate elevate. It will be instantaneous within the first 10 repetitions of that first set. So this response to less venous return and decreased stroke volume is obviously to increase the heart rate to meet the demands of the system. The limb, um, and the body will start to sweat quite rapidly. Beads will pop out in the first or second set. The limb under the tourniquet will swell and have a darker skin tone. This is totally normal, but some people might freak out if their leg is kind of reddish purple. If at any time the patient does become faint, dizzy, has moderate to severe pain, especially under the tourniquet, begins to feel numbness or paresthesias in the limb, we need to stop the exercise. We need to reassess. Uh, is it where we place the tourniquet? Is it 
do they have too many clothes on underneath? Is it, did I assess the right limb occlusion pressure? Once the tourniquet is deflated, the lactate burn goes away relatively quickly. It stays for probably a good hour. Um, the limb will feel heavy and fatigue for about 24 hours. So the individuals will feel a, a mild form of DOMS. They won't feel that fully loaded. I can't get off the couch. I can't sit on the toilet without having somebody assist me. Um, they will feel a little bit of heaviness and fatigue. So pain benefits from BFR training. Um, following BFR patients will experience DOMS, like sensation in the muscles, like I just said, um, that were activated. DOMS will not last as long following a BFR training uh, than the 48 to 72 hour DOMS pain you feel after the muscle breakdown with heavy load and hit training. The muscle will be able to activate with normal force tension with less pain following BFR. I should have probably made that a bigger bold point. So yeah, after you've done a heavy lifting or a heavy session of um, activity, Olympic lifts, uh, running hard, whatever you're doing, you know that sometimes your muscles are sore or fatigued or heavy for even up to 72 hours and you can't produce the same kind of muscle function. You can't produce the same kind of power. You can't go back and do the same kind of load. Well, with BFR, it enables you to be able to create that force, create that tension um, in less time. And I think one of the best keys here is, is the beta endorphin. So the beta endorphins go up at the same rate as lactic acid, meaning as the system increases in lactate, so do the beta endorphins. Beta endorphins help us with pain modulation. So reduction in pain specifically noted in arthritic and tendinopathy conditions. So say somebody has pretty terrible knee osteoarthritis, um, it can significantly help them with pain from the beta endorphins also for them being able to feel, oh my gosh, this is what my quad contraction is supposed to be like. So rehab guidelines. I won't necessarily go through all of these, but you can read them for yourself. Rehab to mitigate atrophy, bone loss, and promote um, a healing environment. You have the ones there for BFR, low-level exercise, the isometrics, uh, the four-way hip straight raise, et cetera. Same setup, progress to isotonic exercises with appropriate 15 to 30% load. We didn't go over much, but E-STEM can be very helpful in the early stages. E-STEM plus BFR, it doesn't feel great to have both the E-STEM and the BFR at the same time, but if you know the patient is able to tolerate it, it's perfectly wonderful. So the latter stages of rehab, return to sport, um, you can do BFR and HIIT training. It's been shown to have some really good gains. We have always have these questions of how long will insurance allow a patient to rehab? How much are they gonna pay for? After 12 weeks, do they wash their hands? After eight weeks, et cetera. Um, would we, uh, do we even get to this point? So that's again why BFR is, is very helpful because we can really front load an individual's um, plan of care three times a week for six weeks and get them to the point that they can lift and they can load appropriately. Uh, over on the right are activities you can do for the lower and upper extremity. Frankly, anything um, that is within the correct scope, fair game. You know, have them do lunges, have them do squats that don't feel good, have them do simple bicep curl or wrist extension. It's, it, it's amazing the improvement one sees. There's a thing here, but I also want to point out some limitations, some things we do need to know. Uh, BFR is a great tool. It's a hack, as it were, kind of like I've we've been saying. It sets the table. It promotes um, the body to start building muscle tissue, start to hypertrophy. But do know that some of the gains start to plateau at six weeks, and there's a there is a pretty substantial plateau at ten weeks. So see your greatest improvements between four to six weeks. So. Um, at this point, I think we've made it to the thank you and questions, and we, I really appreciate your time. I know Lauren does. Um, I hope you guys got something from this. Awesome. Well, thank you. And we do have quite a few questions already coming in here. Uh, I'm just going to start firing them away since I know we have a limited amount of time. So in terms of the limb occlusion pressures, is there value in measuring those in the position that you're going to be having them do their exercises, whether they're supine, seated, standing? 
Yes, absolutely. So, and this, you know, research always is the the perfect scenario. So what happens, we, we're going to put them in supine, we're going to get that perfect resting limb occlusion pressure, but uh, there's a fair amount of research nowadays that is moving towards, I'm doing lower extremity blood flow restriction therapy, and I'm going to be having them do um, a spinal loaded squat lunges, forward and backward lateral. Um, would it be more beneficial to have that pressure? Yes. So I think once you move out of the stages where you're doing more low level activity, yes, I think it's worthwhile to assess in the in the standing position or dependent position. Great. Uh, there's quite there's a few questions here in terms of the timing as it relates to activities. If you're doing it after activities, how long after the activity should you wait? Or if you're doing it before activities. Uh, how long should you wait after BFR for for activities to resume? Are you speaking to the ischemic preconditioning, postconditioning, or are you just speaking to, hey, I've done BFR, should I be able to go run my 5K? So preconditioning-wise, um, preconditioning prior to a race, for example, how soon, uh, what, what kind of timing should you put between the preconditioning and your race? That when that window, sorry, is uh, 24 hours. So 24 hours before or 24 hours after. Okay. And what? How about when it comes to post conditioning? How do you? What's your preference? How do you compare BFR with the compartmentalized compression devices like Normatex, Rapid Reboot, etc.? So Normatex does a great job. Um, it's very beneficial and it might even be a little bit more easy to carry around but you lose that um aspect of personal prescription so the norma tech will provide the uh, pneumatic squeeze as it were but it's a uh, consistent static not really prescribed for the person's particular arterial and venous occlusion do you see this as an applicable tool for a high school athletic trainer? Uh, yes, but it depends on the finances. Always depends on the finances. Um, that also depends on the training. So if there are athletic trainers, absolutely available to apply and to measure. Um, if it is student athletic trainers as in high school student athletic trainers that are helping out or just applied without having a skilled clinician no uh, any concerns with having the pressures on for too long let's say a person is taking a more extended time period to complete all four of their sets is there a time limit where you say let's go ahead and drop the drop the weight or drop the number of reps yeah i would say always keep an eye on your individual if it's taking them 15 minutes to complete a 15 rep session they're cheating themselves and cheating the process um it should take between eight and ten minutes to finish even that uh, set of 30. um how what is kind of the details in terms of does insurance typically approve bfr treatments my understanding is you would do it through your like the 97110 uh, physical exercises. Accurate. So de, de, you said we're kind of in multi states perhaps, but um, here in Florida, you can do it under 97110 or nine, uh, the, oh my gosh, neuro is 97112. Um, you don't have to describe anything to the insurance other than what you're doing. You always be descriptive about, all right, this is. The, the personal prescribed limb occlusion pressure. There's nothing that needs to be attained beforehand other than clearing it through the physician. All right, and how about how soon after surgery, meniscal repair, ACL, Tommy John, um, how, how soon after are you starting BFR? Mm. That depends on the surgeon, honestly. There are some surgeons so I'm going to speak to the lower extremity first. There are some surgeons that will say, you did your knee scope, you're good to go day one or post-op <laughs> three hours post. Um, there are some surgeons that want you to wait um, two weeks 
There's there are some surgeons that want you to wait until the wound has approximated and it does not look like it's going to open up or dehiss. Um, in my history, it's wait until it won't dehiss. Basically, um, for the upper extremity, you have to wait longer. Um, so for UCL um, Tommy John surgery, you're probably going to wait at least at least four weeks. But again, it's all surgeon dependent. All right, great. Thank you very much. And then for everyone who's attending one hour after the webinar concludes, you'll be emailed a link to the evaluation and assessment, and you have 24 hours to complete that assessment. Hope everybody has a great day.